yeah, we'll just wait a minute or two and then we'll get rolling. I do see all the people coming in, which is great. Oh. A lot of excitement today, Veterans Day. It is the day. Yes, indeed. All right, we're getting up there. Okay, guys, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome teachers, students, and many EF staffers. We are so glad you've decided to join us virtually for this exciting event today in celebration of Veterans Day with our very special guest, US Air Force Lieutenant General Bill Wasser. My name is Darby Jones and I oversee educational partnerships for EF Explore America. And I'm joined by my colleague, Sarah Shabin, who oversees loyalty and works closely with teachers from around the country. Sarah will be moderating the event today as we engage in conversation with Bill and are truly honored by his presence with us today. In advance, a huge thank you to you, Bill, and your dad, who I believe is with you and served in World War II for your service to this country and sharing your story with teachers and students far and wide today. We are thrilled to be in an exclusive partnership with the Honor Flight Network that has afforded this opportunity, especially on this commemorative occasion. Veterans Day is truly a celebration to honor America's veterans for their patriotism, for their love of country and willingness to serve and sacrifice for the common good. We salute you. A uh, quick reminder, although we can't see the rest of you, please submit any questions you might have into the Q&A feature. So just type that in uh, during our time together and Sarah will be keeping an eye on that. Um, hopefully we'll have time in, before the end to go through some of those questions. And right now you'll wanna turn your screen to speaker view uh, to focus on, on who's talking today. So with that said, Sarah, I will turn this over to you and to Bill, welcome. Thank you, Darby. Um, we're so excited to be here and to echo what Darby said. Thank you, Bill, for your service. We're grateful that you're here and to hear your story. We'd be grateful for that any day, but especially today on Veterans Day, I think it's something really special. So happy Veterans Day. Thank you. Um, and yeah, so I'd like to start before we, you know, dive into some of your experience. I'd like to get just a little bit of background on you, know, you where you are, um, what you do now, your, your occupation, any you know, family highlights you wanna share just so we could get to know you a little bit better before we uh, talk about your service. Sure, I, I grew up in upstate New York. I went to the University of Buffalo <clears throat> and one of the options uh, in college was to go uh, through ROTC. And I had an uncle who was in the Air Force and I <clears throat> always admired what he did and enjoyed visiting the, uh, the Griffiths Air Force Base. So I joined ROTC and loved it and ended up uh, joining the Air Force for four years, which turned into 34 years. Uh, started out as a maintenance officer uh, and then went to pilot training. Uh, and then my last 10 years, uh, I got to do a lot of senior officer jobs uh, as a general officer. Uh, very proud that all four of our children uh, also went through ROTC at the University of Virginia, go Wahoos. And, uh, and uh, all four of them served uh, in the Air Force. Two are still in the Air Force. Uh, two of my uh, son-in-laws, uh, or the, the two son-in-laws, I have two sons, two daughters, uh, also served in the, in the Air Force. And so we, we bleed blue, uh, which frustrates my Navy dad an awful lot, but uh, mm -hmm. we're very proud of that. And I'm very proud of my kids and, and their service as well as my opportunities that I had in the Air Force. And, and, uh, and today, what I'd like to do, and I wish I could see all of you out there in, in student land and, and with the teachers, uh, let me say that uh, my dad was an industrial arts teacher. Uh, I admire teachers as much as I admire anybody that served in the military, uh, because our teachers are the ones that give us great starts. I can still remember many of my teachers all the way back into early years 
uh, and what they did for me and how they encouraged me. So for all the kids out there, I hope you'll, I hope you appreciate your teachers and what they're doing for you. And in these tough COVID times, uh, we don't pay our teachers enough to do what they're doing during these times. Thank you, Bill. I cannot agree with you more. And we're so grateful to have them with us as well and for everything that they, did, they do. I might also um, throw in, uh, that, Sarah, that I, that I decided to put my uniform back on today. I'm very proud when I have the opportunity to wear the uniform. Uh, but uh, much like many of you out there, <clears throat> when I was in middle school uh, and even into high school, I had no idea uh, that I would be uh, joining the Air Force someday. And so uh, I hope for some of you that you consider that uh, opportunity. Lots of great challenges. Uh, I've traveled around the world. <clears throat> I'm probably one of the only people that can say that they uh, walked around the earth five times and ran around the earth three times. And it sounds kind of like a Forrest Gump story, but in fact, I visited the South Pole and put my hand on top of the pole and did exactly what I just said. So, uh, you know, the opportunities that this young kid from upstate New York had as a result of being in the military, uh, I can't, I can't over exaggerate them. I, I had a great career, a great family and, uh, and appreciated it my entire 34 and a half years. That's incredible. It is amazing the opportunities that come and for something with something that you never expected. It's, it's amazing. And now you're part of a military family. It's incredible. So I'm curious, actually, so you joined the ROTC and, you know, got involved that way. What do you remember about or how you were feeling about when you found out, you know, okay, I'm, you know, went through this program of all of those things. And then you found out, okay, I'm actually going, we're being deployed. What do you remember about that day and, and how that felt? You know, it's interesting uh, because when I went through ROTC, it was in the 70s. Uh, late 60s, early 70s. And so we had a lot of opposition to the Vietnam War. Uh, in fact, the ROTC uh, detachment at, uh, at the University of Buffalo uh, was uh, stoned and burned uh, by some rioters, uh, students for a democratic society. Uh, there was a lot of opposition to the program that I lived through for four years. And I think it just made me realize how important it was for someone to go out and defend our country and be part of the military but also to listen to the other side. Some of their arguments were certainly interesting in, in, about the Vietnam War, but it kind, of, uh, it kind of made me even more dedicated to wanting to go out and serve. And so when I'm, I had, uh, what, Sue and I had 20 plus assignments in our Air Force career, we moved uh, nine times in our first 11 years. And you know, when they came and said, hey, you're going again, you're moving again, if you wanna be in the military, you have to expect that sacrifice and the willingness to go I did spend a year in Thailand as part of the Vietnam War, uh, away from my family. Uh, not an easy year, but at, at the same time, uh, very rewarding uh, career-wise because it taught me a lot uh, about myself and a lot about leadership in that kind of environment. So I think it gave me opportunities that I, that I could never shy away from. And I could encourage others, uh, especially the young men and women that I'm talking to today. Uh, it allowed me great opportunities and it doesn't matter whether you're officer or enlisted, there's opportunities to excel in our United States militaries in all the services. And I, and I say all the services, you know, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and I even include the Merchant Marine and now the Space Force. So there's just a, a lot of excitement in the military today. There is, and I, I appreciate you mentioning that too, because it's so, um, you know, everyone knows the military, but it's so dynamic, all the different things and facets that you can be involved in. So to have so many different types of opportunities available is, is really interesting and definitely worth exploring. And I'll mention one other thing, Sarah, but you, you, when, when I did deploy to Thailand for a year uh, and left my family, my wife and uh, one-year-old daughter, uh, who's in, the, uh, in California, and our home was New York, uh, the Air Force family put their arms around my family. The Air Force took care of my family. Uh, those people that were still there at Norton Air Force Base knew I was deployed and, and they took, and it is, the Air Force to me is a family. And uh, there's people that don't like the military and it's not meant for everyone. But I will tell you that the, the truly success of our military is that in all the services is that they do take care of the families. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm curious actually, how in terms of family, when you were away for that year in Thailand, how did you stay in touch? Was that difficult? Was it hard to keep connected, especially not just time difference, but obviously a different, you're living different lives, you know, in that respect. How was it staying in touch with them? And 
well, yesterday I was talking to a really good friend of mine in France uh, on message, you know, and it was just like being there. Uh, but back uh, in in the uh, in the seventies, uh, you know, it, it, the first phone call I had with Sue was about six months after I arrived there. We wrote a lot of letters and sent a lot of tapes back and forth. But uh, the phone call for three minutes was ninety dollars. Uh, there was no such thing as the internet, and uh, and in that whole uh, year, we she visited for a month, but we all we only talked on the phone three times because mm. you know. We were poor lieutenants. <laughs> we didn't have that kind of money to be spending regularly, and uh, and Sue cried the whole phone conversation anyhow. So it wasn't it wasn't very productive, but it was great to hear her voice today. And and when I became senior in my career, we made sure that our young men and women had connectivity with those in the theater because that is so important. And when you can uh, FaceTime, Zoom, uh, message, uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Teams, you can do all those kinds of things around the world today. Uh, it gives great connectivity for our families. Yeah, and I'm sure that's so important to help, you know, support you guys emotionally and, and them as well back home. It's tough on everybody. Um, someone actually asked a question uh, here, one of the attendees, and they were asking, you know, was it scary when you were there? You know, were you nervous to be there? Or were you, how did you feel when, when you were over? Yeah, it, uh, the realities of my arrival were that there was no room for me on base the first three days. So I had to stay in a hotel downtown in Ubon, Thailand. And uh, the second day I was there, there was a uh, Viet Cong uh, individual <clears throat> that was actually shot and killed trying to uh, enter the base over a barbed wire fence. And so, you know, for a young kid from New York, that kind of made the reality uh, real right away. And, uh, you know, but that is what, it, that's what the military trains you to, to do. They, they train you to do your, your career uh, job, but they also train you survival and they, they train you camaraderie uh, and they train you to adjust to situations like that. And, and I've been shot at, I flew into Grenada uh, in a 141 as the aircraft commander and uh, they were shooting at us as we were, we were landing, but you know, we were trained how to fly into that environment. And, uh, and I've been in, uh, in the desert, uh, part of the Gulf War, uh, at times when we thought we were about to have a scud attack. And, and we weren't worried, we put on our chemical gear, we put on our masks and we were ready to fly the airplane because that's what we had been trained to do. And so any job you go to, whether it's in the military or any other sector, uh, you should always receive great training. And another good reason to pay attention in school because you really are getting the initial training uh, from your teachers right now. And I know that sounds like a recording from your parents, but uh, the fact of the matter is from a guy that lived uh, growing up in that, those environments and I'm here today, it's that training I received all the, way from, all the way back to third and fourth grade. I can remember teachers and things they told me uh, that, that paid off uh, even as late as now I'm 71 years old and it still makes a lot of sense to me. That's fantastic. It's really all about preparation, so important. It is all about preparation. There's another question from um, uh, one of the teachers on the call, Nancy. She's wondering why why is Veterans Day so special to everybody? You know, do you feel that when on days like today? Well, Nancy, you just gave me goosebumps because uh, it's important uh, because uh, our military men and women uh, that deploy around the world and and have a lot of sacrifice and separation from family, uh, and uh, some give the ultimate sacrifice of their life for our country. Uh, this is a day to recognize them. And we have all kinds of other holidays uh, to recognize all kinds of peoples and, uh, and groups. Uh, but this one is truly, truly focused on recognizing people that are willing to put their life on the line to make sure that we continue to have the freedoms into the future that we all enjoy today. That's fantastic. I'm glad you asked that question, Nancy. That was great. Another question, actually, Joel would like to know, what was one of the hardest things that you faced in the war? You know, Joel, that's a great question too, because uh, much like I, I already mentioned, the sacrifice of the families. Uh, as a military member, when you're deployed and you're in a wartime environment, uh, you're also sacrificing. And uh, there's many a day that you wake up uh, frustrated uh, and you, you have to have a positive attitude to go to work every day. You have to have a positive attitude to realize that you're gonna go out and do your job. And, and for some of the individuals in the service, that means you're gonna go out and possibly take a life today. Uh, it may mean that you're going to go bomb a target today. It may simply mean that you're going to go out and have a very bright day because there's nothing going on that day. And I think you just have to keep it in perspective. And so, uh, you know, 
I think that's that's the only way I can capture an answer to that question. Yeah, it's interesting to think about. It's like um, like any job, you have to do your job and prepare properly for it. It's just interesting that this job is so different than many of the ones that we're used to. I was responsible for all the uh, transportation. I, I just got to Scott Air Force Base, and then five weeks later, it was 9-11. And I flew back uh, from California to Scott that day. And it's probably one of the days I've been most scared in my life. Uh, realizing that what the challenges that was were ahead of us. And I was, I was very safely uh, in an office, not an office, in a command center uh, at Scott Air Force Base. Uh, had an incredible amount of responsibility, had a, an amazing team that was working for me, uh, but realizing the magnitude of that. And so the, the fears that you sometimes have don't just come with combat. Uh, they come with uh, massive challenges that we have. I, I feel a fear today with COVID because there are people in our country that are ignoring what could save lives. And, and, and I'm, I'm worried about that. Uh, I certainly uh, don't want to uh, die because of that. And I don't wanna see anybody that's on this recording uh, die from that. I have a very good friend, a fellow general officer who caught COVID and is now in a hospital and uh, they're gonna amputate his leg. And there's a really good chance he's not gonna survive because of blood clots in his lungs from COVID. So, you know, we all have to look at challenges in our life and, uh, and appraise the situation around us and not have such a, a fear uh, that uh, we just need to follow some rules, some basic rules. You know, people that say, well, I don't have to wear a mask because I'm an American and I have my rights. Yeah, I fought for those rights of you to say that. But at the same time, it's pretty, the science of it is that, uh, you know, if you wear that mask, if we all wore masks for the next 90 days, uh, we'd really knock out uh, a lot of this disease and thank God there's a, there's a vaccine on uh, coming up very soon. Yeah, well, I, I wish your your friend the best and luck in recovering. And to your point, it is so interesting to see. You know, you go at such great lengths to protect everyone, and that extends itself much beyond just you know war or not war. It's you want to protect everybody, and however from whatever enemy or it might be. Um, another question, actually, from a couple people. I've asked. Um, they would like to know more, you know, Palmer and Jenny and Jamie would like to know more about the badges that you have on your jacket. You know, how do you go about earning those? What do they mean? Oh, well, you know, it's, it's really interesting. I, I wore the uniform today because it, it uh, I think it, even as a retiree, it, it means a lot uh, for the individuals out there to, to see a person uh, and, and that you see on television. Sometimes people go, a general, oh my goodness, a general. Now it's, oh my goodness, there's Bill who is a general. And, uh, you know, I have my, my uh, pilot uh, wings, I have my maintenance officer badge, I have ribbons that I earn from either everything from being an expert in marksmanship, to serving overseas, uh, to doing extremely well in certain assignments. Uh, so that's what these are. And you can, you can go online and look up uh, military decorations and see what they all are. And there's just, there's hundreds of them that, that, that our individuals in the military can earn. Uh, but, but that's basically, and then of course, the, you know, the stars on the shoulder are the rank and, uh, and other people wear stripes on their sleeves uh, or, you know, eagles or oak leaves on their shoulders. Uh, it's just, it's the rank structure. And in the Navy, it's even a different rank structure. So there's uh, quite a few books that are written on what's on a uniform, uh, what those decorations mean and what's different for all the services. And I would encourage those that are interested in it to either go online uh, or go get one of those books and take a look at it. It will teach you an awful lot. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. So actually speaking of, you've mentioned some of the other, uh, you know, services and branches of the military. David was curious um, how you guys all cooperate with each other since each have their own chain of command and I'm sure their own jobs and tasks and duties. You know, how are they all working with one another? How did you specifically do that as well? Well, you know, I, I was very fortunate to go to a, a joint professional military education schools, two of them. Uh, and that means uh, going to schools with people from other services and uh, in several of my jobs to uh, serve with other services uh, when I was in the Pentagon. And then when I was at Transcom in that, J, in that uh, transportation job that I mentioned. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've come to realize over the years that uh, all the services are important. They all have specialties. They all have uh, core values that are similar, but they all have skills that are different. And when you bring them all together, it allows us to be successful. 
And I always say, as long as Air Force beats Army and Navy in football, I could care because everybody else has to work together. Awesome. Thank you. Um, let's see, there are a couple other questions here. Sarah was curious what your favorite aircraft to fly was, if you have a favorite. Wow, Sarah. You know, I again, a kid who kind of died and went to heaven, uh, I had no idea that I would ever fly uh, because I had uh, I had to wear glasses when I when I was in the Air Force. And when I first came in, you weren't allowed to. And uh, so that's why I spent four years in maintenance and then went to pilot training. But then uh, I also had the fortunate experience of being the director of operations in training command. And in that job, I could fly every airplane in training command. And at the time, there were 21 of them. <clears throat> and I flew every one of them. So in a in two year period, I, I ended up uh, uh, flying uh, 21 different airplanes. And by the time I retired, I had flown 27 different airplanes. Uh, and it, I will tell you that uh, uh, many of them were exciting. I mean, there's nothing like flying a ride in the F-16. Uh, I was not, I'm glad there's young people that do that because I was an older guy and I was glad younger people have that skill to fly a, a fast uh, fighter like that. Uh, I think I enjoyed the 141 and C5 as much as anything because we flew around the world uh, and we not only took cargo into countries where people were starving, uh, but we also brought people back that had been injured in the war and helped save lives through air evac missions. And so I, I was very much, uh, uh, I've, I have literally flown uh, almost around the world with air refueling. And, uh, and so all of those airplanes have different require or uh, different uh, abilities and uh, different missions. Uh, so I, my favorites happen to be the core ones that I flew, uh, but uh, all the other ones that I had the opportunity to fly for one or two sorties uh, are important to our Air Force for either training or fighting the war uh, or carrying uh, troops and, and uh, supplies. And, and I think together, just like I mentioned with all the services earlier, have to work together. All those airplanes have a purpose and they all work together. But, you know, I have, I have a little favor of the C5 and, and the 141 because I have so many hours in both. Great. So a couple more questions. Um, both Joel and Emma have similar questions here. So they were curious, and um, I think it's great perspective as well, to know more about what life was like when, when you got back home from being at war. Were you in pain? Was it difficult adjusting? Um, what was that like? Uh, that, Joel and Emma, that tremendous question because we have lots of men and women that are deployed an awful lot today uh, into the theater and they come home to their families and you know the families have had to live without you and so you know my wife was much more independent uh, when I came back uh, my daughter had not seen me for a year and suddenly I have a daughter who wasn't talking and uh, wasn't potty trained and the next and she'll hate me for that but uh, mm -hmm. but I came back from the war and, and she was walking talking and carrying on sentences and she was a totally different person so you, when you come back uh, from a combat environment, you come away from back from separation from your family and even long uh, temporary duty where you go off for uh, three to six months, uh, your families are, are really enduring that separation and, and probably having a, a more difficult time than you are because you're still doing your job every day. And so when you come back, you have to be flexible. You have to acknowledge uh, that there, there may be different roles that each one of us uh, has to play. And, uh, and I find it really unfortunate uh, it, that many of our families, well, I shouldn't say it that way, that lots of families decide to separate, uh, that some families uh, have some other issues that, that they have to face. And, and most important is their children uh, having to face those issues. And uh, so those of you out there that have moms and dads that have been in the military or are in the military, you know, I, I salute you and admire you. And, and I thank you for your patience uh, when they are gone and for, for helping mom or dad, because we have men and women that deploy, and helping mom or dad or grandparents, whoever's taking care of you while mom and dad are deployed to help uh, keep those freedoms in our country. I, I admire you for what you're doing. Fantastic, thank you. A couple other questions that come in. Um, Tyler and then one other person were interested in knowing, you know, when you're up there flying, did you have any particularly scary moments that you remember? You bet, Tyler. I, I you know. I was in pilot training and, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're just learning how to fly. And of course, you know, it's, it's a lot different than driving a car because you're in a three-dimensional space. And uh, so we were doing our first night flights and they're very simple. You go out in the pattern and you fly around the pattern and you stay in the pattern and you don't do anything uh, to scare you or anyone else. 
And, uh, and all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a, a white light and, and I broke out of the pattern. You know, I put the airplane, it was a T-38, I put it in the afterburner and I pulled the stick back and I climbed out. And uh, of course the people on the ground are yelling, what do you think, what are you doing out there? And I said, I saw something. Well, uh, you know, so they said, you, you have to come in and land immediately. So, okay, I came in and landed immediately. And <clears throat> first, first reaction was, you know, what are you doing out there? You know, that was an unsafe maneuver. And was well, it turned out there were three airplanes that were converging in the same spot at the same time. And I happened to see one of them and I broke out and the other guy broke out and we all avoided each other and we're all alive today. And so that's a scary moment, but it also teaches you that you can yell at me all you want, but you trained me to do it a certain way. You taught me to do it a certain way, just like your teachers are teaching you today. Uh, and you, you follow that training and it will, it can save your life. And so that was a really scary moment. Uh, uh, but there's three people that walked away that night and, uh, and there's a lot of other senior people that were not real happy initially that went, oh my God, thank you. And, and saluted and, and uh, you know, congratulated us for making the right moves. And I learned a lesson from that. You know, always analyze something that happens before you react to it, because it may be there's a secondary story that you need to know before you say something that you wish you hadn't. Yeah, that's a great story. I'm glad, glad it had a happy ending. That's wow. Me too. Nerve wracking moment. <laughs> um, thank you. So another question, and this is great guys. I'm appreciating all the questions that you guys are giving. It's really um, awesome to be able to hear from you guys. So you mentioned, obviously you were in the um, military for, you said, I think 34 years. It's, quite a long time and a great career. So I'm assuming then that a lot of parts of it were rewarding. So uh, one of the attendees would like to know what your favorite part of being in the military has been. Uh, my favorite part was working with people. Uh, I had some of the most amazing people work for me uh, all the way from the time when I was a Lieutenant to when I was a Lieutenant General. And uh, some of them are still very good friends today. And uh, oh, about six months ago, I get, <clears throat> I got an email from, uh, from the national headquarters of Honor Flight. Uh, one of the individuals said, hey, we just received a, an email from somebody that's trying to find you. And I thought, okay. Uh, and so I get this email from this young man out in California. Uh, he and his brother-in-law both worked for me when I was a lieutenant. And they were telling me about how my leadership skills at the time, my leadership performance, I should say at the time, uh, meant so much to them and, uh, and how much they had learned from that that they were to apply over those years. And I'm thinking to myself, this, this is 40 some 45 years after this meeting these guys and they're now contacting me and telling me how much that meant. And I think uh, the lesson there is that we never know the impact we're having on people. And if we treat people the way we wanna be treated, you have to be firm and fair in the military and you have to remember there is a, there is a chain of command and you have to be consistent in the military uh, to be able to execute the mission but if you take people and you take their families into consideration, uh, you will be more successful than if you think, well, I'm a general, so I'm more important than somebody else. If you have that attitude in the military, you should get out of the military. I'm a chief master sergeant. I made the, I made the highest rank I can as an enlist. Wrong attitude, wrong attitude. It should be, I helped a lot of people and I'm very proud of that. And so that's, for me, that's what it is, is working with the people, working with the families and making a difference. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I'm, I'm glad you, um, you know, shared that takeaway as well. There was another question about leadership and how you define that. And, you know, people throughout your career have demonstrated good leadership. And I think it's so nice to distinguish the difference between having the title and then actually demonstrating. Leadership. Yeah, I will say something about leadership. I, I uh, <clears throat> there's a couple of things that, that are, I've lived by. One is uh, take care of the troops, they take care of the mission. So the more senior you become, uh, you got to take care of the troops and their families so they can take care of the mission. The, the other is you always have to have some way of knowing what's going on. I, you know, even when I go to bases now, and, and, and I think that at Patrick Air Force Base uh, that I live near now, I, I just recently met with a, with a lieutenant colonel and, uh, on an issue. And, and I said to him, you know, I, you, don't have to, you don't have to do anything about it because I'm a general or a retired general. But if somebody doesn't tell you about it, you can't fix it. And my theory of leadership is, you know, you have to be able to hear what's going on in, you, in your community that you're leading. You have to listen to people at all levels. And, uh, and those individuals that come and tell you uh, that there's a problem, sir, and, you know, we, 
we, we sure could use your help to fix it. Well, you ought to praise them rather than somebody being mad at them for bringing it up the chain of command. Because, <clears throat> I mean, I don't think the airmen ought to talk directly to the general. They ought to try to fix it at the lowest level they can. Uh, but if it can't be fixed, it's good for the, the senior person to know so they can, they can fix it. Yeah. What you don't know, you can't point. fix. That's a great point. Thank you. Um, okay, so a couple other questions here. Um, you mentioned, you know, those people who reached out to you. Sarah was curious if you're still in contact with um, any friends that you made while serving. Oh, wow, Sarah. Sarah, that's a great name. <laughs> My daughter's a Sarah and we're being interviewed by a Sarah here. Uh, and she's the one asking the question, is Sarah with an H? Yeah, we have the with an H <laughs> and without an H. I have a daughter who's with H and I have a daughter-in-law who's without. So we had a joke about that earlier. Uh, but uh, uh, remind me of the question again, I got off on the Sarah's. Sorry, sorry. So she was wondering um, if you're still in touch with any friends. Oh that yeah, you okay, thanks, yeah. Wow, uh, in, fact, <clears throat> in fact, we send out over 350 Christmas cards a, a year uh, to people that reach back about as far as we can in our careers. And uh, you know, we, we've kept contact uh, with many, many people. And, I, and the older I get <clears throat> and the longer I've been retired, I've been trying to reach out to people that meant a lot to me in my career. Uh, I re recently uh, oh, got a letter from an individual that I had fired uh, years ago uh, who wasn't uh, keeping a high enough standard in a, uh, in a uh, security police organization. And you know, the security police have to have an incredibly high standard. I mean, they protect us and, and they, are, they have the hardest job in the Air Force, I think, is our, our security police, uh, uh, the security forces folks. <clears throat> And he wrote me a letter and said, you know, uh, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. I'm now working in a security agency uh, and, uh, and I have taken some of the lessons that I learned from you and, and applied them. And, uh, and I thought, wow, so here's a guy reaching out to me, just like those couple of kids I mentioned earlier that from California that reached out from one perspective, here's somebody else from a whole different perspective. And so I love hearing from those individuals that I served with. Uh, I don't mind uh, when somebody says, boy, you, were, you, you had a high standard. You were a tough guy to, to make happy. Okay, well, you know, I always looked at it from the perspective of, are we getting the mission done? And on the flip side, am I taking care of the troops and their families? And people that say that you, I worked hard, worked them hard, will always come back and say, but boy, did you take care of us and you took care of our families. And, and I truly enjoy those, that kind of feedback because that was my philosophy and I mentioned that earlier, my leadership, uh, take, you know, take care of the troops, they take care of the mission. So I think that's important to remember. I mean, high standards are important. So kids today, <clears throat> you know, have different lifestyles and, you know, everybody's got their thumbs on a, I, I am, I'm up to date. I do have a regular uh, uh, high, high flute and phone, but uh, sometimes break away from your phone, break away from the games and, and realize what's real. Go out and do some volunteer work. Uh, you know, a good example, honor flight, uh, when, we, when we have uh, the departures at, uh, there's 125 hubs in the United States, and we have people come out to the honor flights in the middle of the night and say farewell to the veterans and wish them the best as they go to Washington, DC. Uh, those young men and women are getting a life's lesson doing that. Uh, they get to meet people that have done incredible things in their life. And so I think it's important that every once in a while we put down social media and we go out and we talk to real people. Yeah, I think that's great advice. and. Uh, you know, your experience too, it's quite obvious you've had a tremendous impact on those that you served with, even if it was tough love, they remember. <laughs> tough loves, you know, my dad gave, my mom and dad were tough love people. They loved us, but every once in a while, <laughs> they were tough on us, tougher than we wanted them to be. And I'll tell you, it, it made <clears throat> my uh, sister and two brothers uh, who we are today. And so I, I think uh, the unfortunate thing is I had a lot of freedoms as a child that kids today don't have. Uh, our rule was you had to be close enough to the house by the time the sun was coming down to hear the whistle in time for dinner. Uh, today, we overwatch our children. Uh, we, we were worried about somebody doing horrible things to our kids and, and it's proven by the fact that it happens. And so we can't operate in fear, we can't live in fear. And, and I love to see uh, my grandkids, I have 11 grandkids. I love to see them out playing sports. I'd love to see them doing things with their friends. Uh, and I love to see them, you know, break away from uh, their social media to do that. Uh, 
another question, uh, speaking of, you know, the young well, and- All those kids out there that just heard me say that hate me for that. Because <laughs> oh my, my grandkids, kids, my good kids always say, grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> they'll appreciate it in the long run. Yeah, they do. And, and, you know, so one day I'm at a restaurant and my 90, my dad's about to be 96 years old and we're sitting there two years ago and we're sitting at a restaurant and my grandkids, three of them are sitting there on their phones playing games. And so I said to them, I said, you know, hey, your grand." your grandfather is here or your great grandfather's here, you know, and he's getting older. It's a good chance to talk to him, you know, and ask him some questions. Well, they all went back to their games right away. So what did I do? I went onto my phone and I texted all my grandchildren, get off your phones and talk to your great grandfather. <laughs> and they immediately responded. And I thought to myself, man, why didn't I think of that earlier? <clears throat> you got to join them. <laughs> I'm deadly serious that uh, for those of you out there, uh, go talk to a veteran. Uh, we're talking about Veterans Day. Go ask mom and dad to take you to a, a veteran's home. I mean, even with COVID, uh, you can uh, you can find a veteran in your neighborhood and socially distance and wear masks and talk to them about their service. They will love you forever. They will be some of your best friends. They will tell you stories that will be very hard to believe. Uh, I, I could sit here for the next three or four hours telling you stories that I've heard from World War II veterans as a part of Honor Flight that, that to me are more than incredible. And, and I served 34 years, never saw what they saw during World War II. And I get people that ask me, well, tell me about the World War I veterans you've met. Well, you know, there are no more World War I veterans. The last World War II, or I'm sorry, World War I veteran uh, died in 2011. His name was Frank Buckles. And, uh, and he's the last one. And there were 16.1 million that went to war in World War II. There's less than 300,000 of those veterans still with us today. So if you know of a World War II veteran, go say hi, you know, go socially distance and talk to them. Uh, it, it'd be really sad if some of them that are living in your neighborhoods uh, don't have anybody to ever tell their stories to because their stories are phenomenal. So I, I encourage you and your parents and your teachers, you know, invite, invite one of these individuals into your virtual or your real classrooms. You know, we can all social distance even at, at 90 uh, to 90 or 100. I mean, there's several of these vets out there that I still stay in contact with that are over 100 years old. And those are amazing stories that they have. Yeah, that's great advice. I mean, it's living history and, you know, humbling mm -hmm. stories. So it's important to do it now while there's the opportunity to. So uh, one of the attendees would like to know what recommendations you have for young men and women who are interested in joining the military. Uh, the best advice I have if you're interested in joining the military is to do, you know, do well in school. Uh, <clears throat> realize that there's a certain amount of discipline that comes with being in the military. Uh, some people earn their, or learn their discipline after they come in the military. Uh, but if you, don't, if you don't mind a little bit of a disciplined lifestyle with a group of people that will, will, will support your back and the opportunity to travel around the world as I've done, uh, then it may be for you. Uh, for some of you out there, you know, you're sitting there going, I don't ever want to do that. Okay, that's fine. Uh, it takes people to be in all walks of life. It, we have to have individuals that want to work in factories and, and want to uh, be uh, uh, app builders and uh, whatever the case may be. But uh, certainly, if you're interested in the military, uh, go to a recruiter's office or go online. I mean, the one, most wonderful thing that you all have that I didn't have is you have the internet. <clears throat> And you can learn so much on the internet. You can go and learn all about all the different military services. If you want to really get involved in something, get involved in space. I mean, look where we're going with space. That's the newest uh, force uh, that was just formed. And, uh, and I'm at Patrick Air Force Base living right in that space community. And they're doing some incredible things. Uh, my son went to test pilot school years ago as an engineer. And one of the four individuals that's getting ready to launch this next week <clears throat> is one of his test uh, pilot uh, school classmates uh, who's getting ready to, to take off and, 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 and go to the space station. So, you know, the sky's the limit. Uh, because of my eyesight, they told me that it wasn't possible to go to pilot training and, uh, and the rules changed and I persisted and I went and I became an Air Force pilot. So if you think you can or you think you want to set that goal, and, and I'll, I'll admit openly that I initially wanted to be a doctor that was my goal all the way up through high school and as I went to college. And I changed my mind in college. And the story is involved, but I won't get into it. But and 
and the good Lord knew what he was doing because I made probably a better general than I would have made a doctor. Uh, and, and, and I had as much fun as I could have ever had uh, doing what I've done in the Air Force as if I had been a doctor. So you, you, do, do, you do take left and right turns throughout your life, but the most important thing is to be a good student, uh, to be a person who accepts other people, uh, a person who is not uh, bullying other people, because uh, when you get into the military, just because you have higher rank, if you misuse that rank, uh, you, you won't go anywhere and you'll be in trouble. So you learn life's lessons in the classes that you're in right now that could make you good military members in the future. So if you have an interest, go research it online, go talk to a veteran and uh, go visit a recruiter. Great, great advice. And actually kind of to piggyback off of that, Claire was wondering how you decided between or to enter the Air Force versus another branch of the military? Well, Claire, that's an easy answer. The Air Force is the best. <laughs> that's um, an unfair answer. <laughs> uh, Claire, I, I tell you, the, the real answer is the, the ROTC program at the University of Buffalo was Air Force ROTC. Uh, I mentioned earlier that my uncle had been in the Air Force. He was a Chief Master Sergeant. I, I liked what I saw. And so, uh, you know, I, I went into the Air Force. Uh, all four of my children had opportunities to do other things, and they all ended up in Air Force ROTC because that's a great way to put yourself through school with scholarships, and all four of them had scholarships. Uh, my son, Michael, uh, was uh, he was thinking back and forth about doing Air Force or Navy ROTC, and of course, my dad, who served uh, 10 years in the Navy, would have thought that that would have been a great thing, but you know, Mike uh, decided that the Air Force is what he wanted to do rather than the Navy, so all of us make decisions in life. Mine was to uh, try Air Force RTC. I initially went in for four years. And like I said earlier, I stayed for 34. Right. And how many, how long were you a general? Uh, some, uh, what, uh, 1998 to 2005. So I don't Fantastic. do public math. So, so eight, about eight years. Claire said that her dad is a Navy vet. And so she had to ask. And thank you. Well, Claire, give him a big hug because. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're in whatever service you're in, the fact that you're serving uh, and being a veteran is uh, important to the, to the freedoms of our country. Very true. Thank you. So we have a few minutes left. I want to wrap up by just asking if you have any other advice or words of wisdom for, you know, the young people on the call. We have so many students here. Is there anything that you want to leave them with um, to take? Sure. I'm, I'm going to sound a lot like your parents probably, but uh, you know, and my dad being a teacher, one of the things you, when your dad is a teacher, or your mom's a teacher, uh, the last thing you want to do is ever get in trouble at school because it gets to them faster than you getting home that day. Uh, he's very successful in business today. So I guess my advice is uh, listen to your teachers. Uh, and, and I say that, and for all the teachers out there, you have a responsibility to make sure that you're treating your students fairly, that you're treating them all equally, and that you're not having biases. I had teachers that had biases, and I did not like some of those teachers. So I, I will admit openly <clears throat> that going through school, uh, from uh, elementary school all the way up through college, that there were some teachers that I did not respect. And for teachers, you know, that's the number one thing you have to work on. You have to make sure that you're treating your students equally and that they respect you. They don't have to like you. There's a difference between liking and respecting. And you need to respect your teachers and teachers, you need to respect your students. And every student out there, male and female, whatever in today's environment, uh, you need to respect each other. You may not agree. And there's, there's things in society today that I must admit to you that I am very difficult time adjusting to. But the fact of the matter is, everybody is a human being put on this earth uh, to live a life and they all need to be respected. And the worst thing in the world you can do is be a bully or be somebody that doesn't respect a fellow individual or cause a fellow individual through social media or through whatever the case may be. Uh, and some of you are going to completely ignore everything I'm just said and going to say, you know, the fact is that you, if you ever ever do something that causes another person to take their life or another person to, to not have a, uh, a good life, uh, to have a life that you would want to have, uh, then, you know, you, you really, that's too bad. And I don't want to leave on a negative note, 
but I will tell you that uh, one of the things I learned in school, and I, and I, uh, I was very, I did not like to get up in front of a class and speak. But I, I realize that if I'm the first one to do the book report, I'm the first one to get up and speak, and I get to sit back and listen to everybody else fumble about it. And so, you know, I suddenly became a leader in that regard. And then class uh, leadership, I became a class vice president and then a class president and, uh, and learned about leadership. And I learned about uh, leading people. And I learned about uh, management. And you don't manage people. You manage resources and you lead people. And, and those are important lessons to learn. And you can learn them as early as I remember back to third grade and second grade uh, lessons that I was taught. But you really learn them you know, when you get into sixth, seventh, eighth. And when you're maturing and you're uh, physically developing and, uh, and you're having different attitudes about boyfriends, girlfriends, and the whole nine yards, you need to remember to always respect yourself and expect others to respect you. And that's uh, when you come into the military, it's that's a life's lesson. If you respect the people that you're working with and they respect you, you're going to be successful. And so I think I've learned in life that that the most important thing is to is to fall in love with people that have long hair. I don't care if they wear earrings. I don't care about their tattoos anymore. Those things that used to bother me and drive me crazy as I was growing up, they just aren't important. What's important is whether I can trust you, whether I can trust you. Whatever, whatever the situation may be, can I trust you? And can you trust me? And if we build that trust and we build a friendship, it'll last a lifetime. That's fantastic. Thank you, Bill. I, I really appreciate it. And I can't tell you um, how grateful we are for you to spend this time with us and impart your wisdom and your perspective because it's, it's unique and it's special. And we're just so happy to have you here with us, especially today. And uh, thank you for today and your service. And I'll ask Darby if you have anything to add. Hey, Darby, before you say that, I, yeah. can I have all the kids and, and teachers that are out there today <clears throat> that know a veteran, can you make sure you go either make a phone call or if it's a parent or a grandparent, uh, or somebody that lives in the neighborhood, uh, go socially hug, distance, hug them. Uh, go, go make sure they know that you care about their service. And, and that's the most important thing you could do for me today. Darby. Yeah. Bill, happy Veterans Day. It was such a pleasure having you with us. Um, we're so proud of our partnership with the Honor Flight Network. And thanks to everyone at home and at schools around the country for, for joining in. This was really terrific and meaningful for us. And I and, uh, hope that it was for you as well. So happy Veterans Day. Thank you. And it's called Education First for a reason. Happy Veterans Sorry. Day. <laughs> thanks so much, Bill. Bye to everyone at home. Happy Veterans Thank Day. Thank you. Bye-bye.